I'd like to uh, welcome you here by saying hey. From what I uh, recently learned, that is how you say hi in Lenape. And on behalf of the National Park Service, it is our great honor to welcome a delegation from the Delaware Tribe of Indians back here to Lenape Hawking. The Delaware Tribe of Indians are the modern day descendants of the Lenape, the original indigenous people of the Passaic River Valley, and one of three federally recognized Lenape tribes. I would like to introduce Mr. Jeremy Johnson, Cultural Education Director of the Delaware Tribe of Indians. Which is based in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Before his current role, he served as the Assistant Chief of the Delaware Tribe of Indians. Mr. Johnson is a lifelong educator who's worked for over 18 years as a middle school and high school English teacher and coach. He is committed to preserving and revitalizing the Lenape culture and language for the future generations of his tribe. Mr. Johnson currently re resides in Noble, Oklahoma with his wife on Beecho Lutuween and two children, Marion and Jennings. Mr. Johnson will now introduce his team. Hello, how are you all? My name is Jeremy Johnson. I am Lenape, Shawnee, and Peoria. My family are the Curly Heads, the Wilsons, the Longbones, and the Waters. That's my line I come from. Uh, we are happy, we all are happy you are here. And Lenape Hoking Katapi, Lenape Hoking Katapi, you are on the Lenape homelands. <laughs> Get that Alexi Hutch? We need to work on your Lenape. <laughs> this language, the different dialects of the Lenape language, we have some uh, of our relatives here as well. Uh, the Muncie dialect and the Wanami dialect were spoken in this area for thousands of years. And so you don't hear it much anymore because we are no longer here. We're going to explain why we are no longer here. But what I asked you was, do you speak Lenape? And I asked, are you well? To a couple. So, Kulomosi Hutch is, are you well? How are you? Is our basis. And so when we hear Hutch, that's our question mark. So anytime you hear a Hutch, it's like, oh, they're asking a question because they didn't have inflection. So if I say Kulomosi Hutch, the answer is the answer you gave, which was Osami. Osami. Can you guys say Osami? Osami? Osami. It means I'm fine. So you may be lying to me. That's okay. So, Kulomosi Hutch? Ah, there you go. So uh, just a little bit of uh, our Lenape language. And as uh, Elise pointed out, hey, is our greeting, it is our hello. It was not used as a greeting until uh, in, in the general public besides us. So until contact with us. And so it became a common greeting. And you could trace the history back to that. It was never used as a greeting in literature in any type of recorded written histories until contact with us so people picked it up so even speaking Lenape all your life just probably not in the proper ways like you know hello get away from me no you know <laughs> hey what are you doing so but you have been using that and that's common parlance now so I just want to tell you a little bit about who we are and I actually want to uh, say we are from Bartlesville Oklahoma we are part of the Delaware tribe of Indians that is our official name uh, we are trying to kind of change some of that because we are Lenape people Delaware, you're here talking about this. Delaware refers to our groups ended up in the south, in the, in the Oklahoma area, and it was a name given to us. Our name for ourselves is Lenape. Now, you hear me use it interchangeably because it is hard over the years growing up saying, well, we're Delaware, we're Lenape. We know we're Lenape, but we always refer to ourselves as Delaware also. That came about from the 1750s in the French and Indian War and being removed from our homelands along the rivers and the areas of Lenape Hawking, people started saying, hey, and referring to most of us as Delawares, because those are the people who lived on the, it was not correct, but they said, those are all those people who lived on the Delaware River. They grouped us all together in that sense, they started calling us Delawares. Not our name for ourselves, Lenape. And then we have different dialects of our language, and so we refer to our northern relatives as the Muncie because of their dialect. They're not a different people. They are Lenape. It is simply their dialectical differences. Make sense? Clear as mud. It's going to get a lot more complicated, too, just so you know. 
as far as we can remember. The archaeologists wanted to argue with us. They said, oh, you guys only lived there for 3,000 years. That was their first thing they told us. And we knew better. We have stories that go back further than 3,000 years that we pass on. Then they said, oh, okay, okay, okay. We will bring 5,000. We're like, you're wrong. Then they said, okay, 8,000. Hey, that's, that's, we're, we're pushing with eight, is what they told us. So like, you're wrong. Then they signed, finally said 10,000. Then not too long ago, they finally said 12,000. And right now, though, because they're, they're not still not listening to us, but what they're trying to, they're proving to themselves, what we've already told them, it's been 16,000 plus years and it's pushing 18,000 because we still have stories of that ice shelf in the ice age of coming to it. We have stories of driving the uh, Cherokees into their home territory south at the same time. And they have stories of coming to that ice wall and realizing they couldn't live there and moving south and encountering us. Our societies were, were water people. There's thousands of settlements over thousands of years along all the waterways in Lenape along the coast. Anytime you see the convergence of two waterways, there was probably going to be a settlement there. Beware all the cities here in Arlenape Hokie, you can tell, most of them have been on waterways, right? Those were where we showed people to settle. Well, I got to tell you this, Lenape means the people. Most tribal names for themselves mean the people. Um, frequently the term Lenny Lenape is used to refer to us. Not correct. Um, Lenny Lenape was a term that kind of wormed itself in in the 1800s somehow. Throughout all the history, we refer to ourselves as Lenape, and it's recorded. And then for some reason, in the 1800s, somebody said something about Lenny, which means common, and started going, Lenny Lenape. And we're like, and then it just stuck. Someone wrote it down, and it became the gospel of who we were. Not true. So Lenny, we're trying to get that corrected. It's, it's 100 plus years of trying to correct that, that we're not Lenny Lenape. We're not common Lenape people. We are the people. Our society was made up of three clans. Speaking folks, it comes from there. The turtles are southern. Now, it doesn't mean that there weren't turtle clan members in each. They were all around. And Turkey. So the Turkey were what we would call our captains and our people whose mothers did not have a Lenape clan. So if someone was, quote, unquote, married, different idea there, partnered with someone from another tribe, the woman there, and they didn't have a Lenape clan, then their kid would be, their children would be turkey clan. But we were matrilineal. So you were the clan of your mother. So if my mother was turtle and my father was wolf, turtle clan. We followed our mother's clans. Early Lenape life, kind of get this out of the way, I think most of us are intelligent and educated enough to realize that we did not live in teepees here. Teepees are plains things because teepees were made with buffalo skins. We don't see, I know they had some Eastern buffalo, much smaller, that went extinct, but there's not enough to really utilize their hides for dwellings. We had wickawamps, which were single family dwellings, which were rounded, domed homes with a single door, and we had a longhouses, which would you have a extended family with stay in those. Now, the thing is, there is no, we didn't have a sense of privacy like we have today. So all these families live together, all these family members, extended families, grandparents, uncles, aunts, you know, all the kids all live together in these longhouses. One thing that's amazing about these longhouses is they had doors on either end. They had fires burning them all the time. They also, many of them had heated floors in the winter. They would bury rocks underneath the surface, cover them with mats, and those fires would heat those rocks in the winter. So when we talk about our culture, I cannot stand when people start talking about primitive Lenape culture. We were not primitive by any means. We were the foremost scientists of our day. You start talking about the pottery we made. You see different types of materials and pottery. It's not just clay. You'll see mica and different things. There are reasons for that because of insulation purposes, heating purposes. We were basket makers. We were fishermen. If you go out here on the Passaic River and the water, the top, and the water gets low, you can see the remnants of a fishing weir. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a wall that we built out of stones and we would take nets and drag the river and 
capture all those fish in that weir so we didn't have to go spear or shoot them or try and fish for them. We could just reach down, grab them, smack their heads on the ground and go, go clean them and eat them. So there are no hereditary chiefs within our society. We don't have clan mothers within our society. That's some different things, Haudenosaunee, some different northern, other northern tribes have some of those. We don't. Touch briefly on our, our, a little bit of our beliefs. We do believe in one creator, Kishele Mokong, which translates to the being who created everything around us. Now there are other lesser spirits in the world. Monotho, they control certain things within the world, but they all come from the creator. We do not worship the Monotho, we honor them. Some of my favorites though, they're spirits of all kinds of different things. Uh, one of the ones that has been passed down for many generations is the Messing, who's the guardian of the game animals in, in the forest. And we had ceremonies to honor the Messing and praise the creator at the same time. And that was called the Hing, Hing Kao, the big house ceremony. But we had some other things, some even lesser spirits. One of my favorite is the uh, Awan Tuntak, the little people. The little people can be very helpful when you're in the woods if you appeal to them, but they can also be very terrible tricksters and lead you astray, get you lost, get you into trouble. Also torture you if you didn't honor them. So when things start disappearing, we still say, little people must have got it. Fight. We, we were diplomats first though. We didn't like to fight unless we had to. So we were compacted down. Then we had William Penn come along and he was a little bit more progressive from his time for his time because he was a Quaker and he had those strong beliefs. 1737, after five or four more years, they perpetuated the 1737 walking purchase in which they stole in one day 1,500 square miles of land from us because we agreed to sell William Penn's sons as much land as a man could walk in a day and a half from a certain point and to draw a line down to the Delaware River. What they did over that five years of, of planning for this they went and lead with a man named James Logan. They began speculating and selling the land already and clearing paths so people could walk a much easier of that day and a half. Not only did they let do that, they also hired professional runners, three of them, in a relay race for a day and a half. They ended up in a day and a half going 60 miles west to Mauchung, Pennsylvania, and then drew a line down the river. And they even took a, a slightly bigger angle instead of due west so they could increase their land. And then after that was signed, the Penn brothers are basically saying, get out now. Some of our people saw the writing on the wall much earlier and they had already moved out. They'd moved to the western Pennsylvania around the uh, Monongahela and the Allegheny and the Ohio rivers at Fort Pitt. In 1724, we had settlements out there. Now, during the 1750s, we sided with the French and the French Indian War. And after that, the fledgling United Colonies, as they're starting to kind of group up together, they realized that they probably need us on their side after the French and Indian War. Even though we weren't very basically the victors there, they realized what they were going to have to deal with when it came to Lenape, the Shawnee, the Wyandotte, the Miami, the Oneidas, the Senecas, the Haudenosaunee. After they realized this, because the British got the Haudenosaunee on their side. And so the United States said, well, we need people on our side. They started courting us as to help them. So. We helped them during the, the Revolutionary War. Uh, the first Native American commissioned officer in the Continental Army was a man by the name of Captain White Eyes. Now, his name was not actually Captain. That term was the term that was given, a name given to leaders of men. And he actually achieved the rank of Colonel in the Continental Army. That they are indigenous in a certain way. She's wearing a ribbon skirt, which is not only for Lenape women, many women throughout different indigenous nations wear ribbon skirts of varying degrees. This one is a very uh, uh, great example of one that is almost like a daily wear, but still dressing up. It's a still a way to dress up. Some of them get really fancy with the ribbon work. This is one that she put together, and this is kind of a, a common way our women put these ribbon, ribbon skirts together. She's also actually, it was just a shirt which has some applique uh, feathers on there to match her her skirt and she's vested up with her bead and bone and silver earrings there and one has an arrowhead there that she you know Lenape uh, person had made that arrowhead and she dressed it up with some turquoise to match her the colors on her dress and things so thank you Beverly. Billie Jean 
Billie Jean is also dressed in a very contemporary style, but she has a few other touches as well. You see her, her Lenape dress in our traditional Lenape colors of red and black with some white there. And then she has uh, accent with her moccasins here, which you see the, fl uh, the ribbon work on the flaps and the bead around the edge and her beaded toe. And she's dressed it up with some turquoise and uh, yes, grandmother's beads. So they came from her grandma, so all of her jewelry came from her grandmother's bees and things. So this is how she would dress. So she just really wants to look nice. Maybe she's gonna give a meeting or just go meet some people like she's meeting you today. So she's just very nice for you all today. Thank you, Billy. Next we have Brandy. Brandy has very similar attire. She has her ribbon skirt she made, her moccasins she made and beaded on the toe. And if you look at this toe beaded, if you get a chance to look at how she did this, it is very reminiscent of a white oak leaf. It's kind of a stylized white oak. And that's the things that we carried with us. We carried the landscape with us in our designs to Oklahoma. And that is kind of an example of that. She also has earrings that she beaded here. And she's also wearing an Osipa lounge that she made, which is a little bit different than Bess's. Um, and, she, and then the materials used a different type of broadcloth and how it's edged. And she hasn't decorated hers yet. That's in process of decorating up to her. She has a few little things on there and she's gonna add things as she goes. So she, she thinks it's gonna be nice on there. She's also carrying, let's go to the tulip purse. She's also carrying a tulip bag. This tulip bag is very much inspired by the Dutch tulips that we saw the Dutch bring in. Now we had tulip designs before the Dutch, but that is because of the tulip poplar trees, the leaves. And we didn't have the flowers, but we had the tulip poplar leaves that looked very similar. Now we did take this design and our women started making these purses with these panels that look resemble a tulip bud. And then it's lined on the inside. Sometimes they'll use satin or silk and she's used a design cloth here so when you unfold it it looks very much like a tulip flower and it's also very utilitarian these are de uh, decorative pieces the fringe hanging down where she's added different types of beads and it's a drawstring purse and it is very uh, utilitarian and that you know she's still got to be able to carry her phone and her her money her sunglasses I'm sorry Brandy your money's gone now but you just, and I'm terrible at it because I don't carry these, but there we go. Then she uses that drawstring to tighten it back up and it looks more like that toilet bulb thing. So there you go. That's a very traditional piece that we've carried for hundreds of years. She's also carrying what we call a mash coat. A mash coat is an old, old piece that we start uh, producing as soon as we start trading. This is a precursor to the skirt the best is wearing. This is a precursor to the shawls you see with the fringe on them and different other uh, dance styles. This is what we started making. All of those ribbons are silk ribbon, French silk. She had hand sewn on there. It took her over two weeks and then she also edge beaded it. Each one of those beads she has to put on individually and there are hundreds if not close to a thousand or more beads on there. She's also decorated with some different beads on the bottom to make it her own there. And uh, this is not something you can buy. She had to hand stitch all of this. There's, and I'll tell you right now that French silk is not cheap either. So our women would wear it different ways. You want to show it on the shoulders. So our women would wear it in this way. There you go. Much like the shawls. And then she would also wear it like I said, it was a precursor to this wrap skirt the best is wearing. They would wear it around their waist, fold it down, and oftentimes the belt or something. So that is what Brandy's wearing. Thank you.